Today's speaker for Tea Talks is a pro- Professor David Cranston, professor and urologist、uh, at the University of Oxford. He is very well known not only in the UK but also in Asia, especially in Burma. Actually,、uh, he was、um, he was looking after Aung San Suu Kyi's husband for many years. Aung San Suu Kyi's husband、uh, has been professor here、yes. at Oxford University.、Um, and、uh, today, David Cranston is going to talk about Sir William Osler. Who is one of the founders of Johns Hopkins Hospital? So lots of inspiring and inst- interesting. Sorry, lots of interesting and inspiring stories about Sir William Osler. Let's welcome Professor David Cranston. So、uh, thank you very much. And here we are in 13 Norham Gardens, which was. The home of Sir William Osler when he was in Oxford. He was the professor of medicine, Regis Professor of Medicine. Regis means that you're appointed by the king or the queen, and he was here for the last part of his life, from 1905 to when he died in this house in 1919. He was a Canadian. He was born in Ontario. In 1849, and he was named after William of Orange. And initially, he wanted to become a clergyman, but he changed his mind to medicine, and he went to medical school in Toronto, qualifying in 1872. And he spent time in Canada,、uh, also travelling to Europe, where he enhanced his medical education. And then he moved to、uh, Pennsylvania, and then to the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And he、uh, was one of the founding fathers of the new Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And there's a very famous page painting, the original of which hangs in the medical library. At the Johns Hopkins, by a very famous American portrait artist called John Singer Sargent, who worked in London, and after Osler was appointed to Oxford, his three colleagues, Welsh, who was a pathologist, Halstead in surgery, and Kelly, who was a gynaecologist, came over to Oxford, and this picture was painted in London. By this American portrait artist, and there's a wonderful story of Osler asking if if he could、uh, use and wear his Oxford doctor robes, which are actually outside、uh, in the、uh, corridor here. And Sergeant said, "Absolutely not.、Uh, that is too red. That Oxford uh, colour. Uh, I've、uh, put water on it." I've buried it to try and get it a less、uh, red, but it can't lose its colour. So you can't be painted in that. But if you could get a nice Dublin degree, which is a much nicer shade of pink, then I could paint you in that. So in fact, Osler, who is seen there third along, although he has got some red on him, it's not his Oxford doctorate gown. He was、uh, the most famous physician of his day. And had an international reputation, and here he is in 1891 working on his very famous medical book called *The Principles and Practice of Medicine*, which became the standard textbook for medicine for probably、uh, 50 years through many different、uh, editions, and he did it himself. Uh, and it was a great labour of love, and one of the things which I guess, to some extent, became a little bit of a, a chain around his neck was that every three years he had to revise it. We have a copy of one of the early editions signed by him in the library next door. He was also extremely well known for his sayings. For example, here's one. He said, "To study the phenomena of disease, 
without books is to sail an uncharted sea, while to study books without uh, patience is like uh, a sailor who doesn't actually go to sea at all. He was essentially the first physician who actually took students to the bedside to uh, examine patients and was very well known for his bedside teaching. Indeed, when he was in Oxford later in life, he used to do a ward round at the Radcliffe Infirmary every Sunday morning. And in those days, the Oxford medical students would go, after finishing their preclinical training in Oxford, would go down to London to do their clinical training. But such was his reputation that they were prepared to get on a train and come up to Oxford every Sunday morning to do a ward round with Osler. And here he is uh, at the side of a bed inspecting a patient's abdomen. And then he talks about feeling, palpa palpation, and then listening with a stethoscope, auscultation. And then after he's got all this information together, then he sits and contemplates and works out the diagnosis. He married uh, late in life, uh, and it was the <coughs> widow of another well-known American surgeon that he married. And the story goes that uh, he spent so much time on the textbook, and when he'd actually finished his textbook, he took the first edition and he put it down at her feet and said, here you are, now what are you going to do with the man who's written it? And they got married. And they had one child who died very young in America after a week. And then later on they had another child called Edward Revere Osler, Revere after his mother's uh, maiden name and one of her ancestors who uh, was Paul Revere, very famous in American history for warning the Americans of the approach of the English at uh, Lexington. So it was in uh, 1905 that he then came to Oxford as the Regis Professor of Medicine, invited by the Prime Minister on behalf of the King. We have a copy of that letter in the library and he became a fellow of Christ Church uh, and uh, lived here in 13 Norham Gardens. Here is him with his son, who very, very sadly, to his great uh, uh, sh uh, sadness, died in uh, Ypres in the First World War in 1917. And uh, no family, anyway, to leave this place to, so he left it to Christchurch, and then it eventually it came into the hands of Green Templeton College, who now look after it. He wrote many, many books, and here's another of his sayings, the greater the ignorance, the greater the dogmatism, the idea that if you don't know something, then often you shout to make people think that you know it. And he was also, here's a picture of him, with one of the treasures of the Bodleian Library. And he uh, was very influential in the Bodleian Library in Exford, uh, Oxford. He was involved in getting the first folio edition of Shakespeare into the library. Observe, record, tabulate, communicate, use your five senses, learn to see, to hear, to feel, to smell, and to know that by practice alone you can become an expert. He was extremely well known for his care for patients. His junior staff used to say if you wanted to see the chief at his best, watch him as he walks past the bedside of some poor patient. He'll also always spend time with them. And he, he said that the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And he was always very interested in caring for his patients. And he did uh, do a lot to develop the science of medicine, although he said that it's the science of uncertainty and the art of improbability. He was wonderful with children. He used to be on the same level as the person that he was talking to, whether it was a child 
or whether it was talking to the king or the queen. And indeed, when he was in Oxford, he uh, looked after the Prince of Wales in his day when he was a student in Oxford. He said, we're here to add what we can to life, not to get what we can for it. And that it's simpler to buy books than to read them, and it's easier to read them to absorb their contents. He, there are many Osla societies now around the world, in America, in Canada, in London, in Japan. There's one shortly starting in China. Here's a Canadian stamp with his uh, picture on it. And he said one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicine. He uh, also said that in the first part of his life he had 20 medicines for every disease and in the latter part of his life he had uh, one medicine for 20 diseases. There are many uh, famous photographs of him around the place. Uh, here's uh, uh, what he said about the 20 drugs for each disease and one drug for 20 diseases. And uh, he said that soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. Uh, and uh, this is a wonderful quote of his, look wise and say nothing and grunt. Speech was given to conceal thoughts. <clears throat> but he was uh, a great philosopher as well. He was a great reader. He collected many uh, different books on different subjects around the world. And again, next door in his library, we have a lovely bookcase which opens to reveal another bookcase behind it. And in that bookcase, he used to put the books that he'd bought that he didn't want his wife to find out, either how much he'd spent or what he'd uh, put in them. <clears throat> he talked about the value of experience in not seeing much, but seeing wisely. One of his great legacies was that he established the medical residency programme where he uh, took young doctors and put them through a training programme in a specific uh, specialty. His was in general medicine. And taking them from uh, young doctors through the residency programme to senior doctors and uh, was absolutely insistent that his residents but also the students would learn from seeing and talking to the patients. His book The Principle and Practice of Medicine, uh, the final edition was produced in 2001 so a medical textbook although often revised lasted over a hundred years. And interestingly enough, uh, one of Rockefeller's uh, fundraisers read that book, took it with a medical dictionary on holiday in about 1895, and read it, found that it was very readable for the layman with uh, medical explanation. And it was that textbook that he then said to Rockefeller, we need to invest money in medical science and it was through that textbook that the Rockefeller Foundation and money for medicine started. He, this is the um, plaque at his hometown in uh, Canada where it says that he taught medicine at some of the greatest schools of the day including McGill, Johns Hopkins and Oxford. His lectures and his revolutionary methods of medical instruction and measures to protect public health. Gaining world renown, he became known as the father of clinical medicine. And so here it was in this house in Oxford that he spent his latter years. As I say, uh, after his son died in 1917, he was never quite the same again. And one uh, person at, in biochemistry where he often used to go down to one of the uh, not important people, but one of the uh, lesser important people that he always used to stop and talk to. He uh, summed it up by saying that uh, Professor Osler has never been the same since his son died. 
he looks the same when he talks to everybody else but he always used to spend time with me with a smile on his face as he went out and since his sons died he hasn't done that so that was his great sadness his wife was a huge support to him and she lived on for about 10 years after him in this house which then went to uh, further Regis professors of medicine who lived here who were fellows of Christ Church. So thank you very much and it's been a great pleasure to introduce Osler to you today.